So it's a great pleasure to be here again at the Virtual of the UK conference. Um, my name is Perry Elliott, I'm Professor of Cardiovascular Medicine at UCL and St Bartholomew's Hospital. And in the first of my talks today, I'm going to be discussing some of the latest updates in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. But before I start, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the history of this disease, because I think that informs the agenda that we have moving forwards in this condition. Now, the condition itself is very simply defined by the presence of a thick heart, which is not explained by common conditions such as valve disease or high blood pressure. And what you see on the screen here is a typical echo scan, ultrasound scan of the heart, where here you have the left ventricle, the main pumping chamber on the left, here the right ventricle, here the atrium, the left atrium, and this thing opening and closing is the mitral valve. And here, this is the wall between the two ventricles, and this is dramatically thickened when compared to the back wall here of the left ventricle. And this is the, the appearance that we see in typical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Now, physicians have been describing thick hearts for centuries. Um, we can go back to the 17th century where there were clearly people being described or families even being described. And then over the years, physicians have described the characteristic clinical findings. And the modern story, I suppose, begins with this chap, Donald Tier, who described a family of individuals who had sadly passed away from the condition. And he described the classical thickening of the heart and the derangement of the muscle cells under the microscope, as well as abnormalities in the mitral valve and the presence of scarring in the heart muscle. Soon after, cardiologists started to detect this phenomenon. Here is another echocardiogram, the left ventricle here, the thickened muscle between the right and the left. And if you look carefully at the valve here, the mitral valve, as it closes, the leaflets bend forwards and touch the muscle, obstructing the flow of blood as it passes out of the heart. And this is what we call dynamic obstruction. And really for much of the history of this disease, the focus has been on this phenomenon because it causes symptoms such as chest pain or tightness, breathlessness and fainting. Over the past 50 years or so, various uh, individuals have explored and developed ways of dealing with this, this obstruction. So we have the story of surgery in this disease with pioneers such as Andrew Morrow in the United States. Russell Brock in the UK, Bill Cleland, who probably did the very first operation for this disease. We had the development of drugs, which, if you, which helped to reduce the, the movement of that valve forwards, beta blockers, verapamil, disapyramide, with again pioneers such as Eugene Brownwald, Doug Weigel. We had the development of so-called septal alcohol ablation, where rather than removing a part of the muscle heat, from the septum, as the surgeons do, we inject alcohol into the muscle to try to shrink it. And this was pioneered by Ulrich Sigwart and Dr. Kuhl in Germany. And then there was the, the use of pacing in trials to try and reduce obstruction. And again, various pioneers there, Dobert in France, Rick Nishimura in the United States, and Barry Marin. For, again, decades, people have focused on other complications of this disease with a particular emphasis on sudden cardiac death. I'm sure many of you out there who have this condition or have a relative with this condition will know that once you receive this diagnosis, the, if you put those two words into a search engine, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the thing that will scream back at you is the risk of sudden cardiac death. And there's been a huge debate in trying to develop ways in which we can predict this kind of event and therefore protect people. There have been different schools of thought, um, particularly between the United States and Europe, but in recent years there's been a convergence of views and I think we've now got pretty robust ways of, of identifying those individuals who are at risk. And of course over the past 20 years the thing that's made the, a massive difference in our ability to protect people has been the development of the implantable cardioverter defibrillator, a device which is implanted under the skin or under the muscle, which detects abnormal heart rhythms and can deliver a shock to re restore the heart back to a normal rhythm. 
So I think for the past few decades, obstruction has been one key emphasis. The second has been the prevention of sudden death. And the third, I think, has been the focus on the cause for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. As I implied in one of those opening slides, it's been recognized for, for centuries that this can be an inherited disease. But the first gene was really only discovered in the late 1980s in a combination of geneticists such as the Simons in Boston and clinicians such as Bill McKenna, where large French Canadian family were studied and a gene in, in a, a protein called beta myosin heavy chain was identified. Now this was really important because it gave us for the first time a window on what the cause for this disease might be. Now, beta myosin heavy chain is part of the mechanism that causes heart muscle cells to contract. And in this cartoon, you see the molecular motor, if you like, which causes the cells to contract, where you have so-called thick filaments made by this protein, beta myosin, and the thin filaments actin, whereby these filaments combine and slide across one another. Beta myosin, the first gene to be identified, is part of this essential motor that causes cells to contract. It soon became apparent, however, that it wasn't just beta myosin heavy chain that caused the HCM. And in fact, genes that code for different proteins of this same motor were identified over the following decades. And indeed, if you bring this up to date, we now have a whole family of genetic disorders, as well as sort of rare conditions which can present in early childhood or indeed in older patients which some of which are genetic, some of which are acquired diseases, but they can present to a cardiologist with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So I think if, if we look at the questions that we're now trying to answer, one of the curious ones to start with perhaps is how common is this disease? As I've shown you, we've been studying this condition for a very long time, and yet there is still a little bit of a question mark over this. And this is interesting. I'll refer to this paper back in 1957 a couple of times in my presentations today by a cardiologist called Wallace Brigden. He, he was the first probably to use this term cardiomyopathy. And he said at the time he published this paper that the true incidence of cardiomyopathy was unknown, but probably higher than is generally supposed. And I think even now that is still the case. And this statement is also very true, that clinicians are so sensitive to the, to the frequency of common diseases, such as coronary disease or hypertension, that they're sometimes reluctant to diagnose people with a cardiomyopathy. I think that's much better than it used to be, but I, I think we still see this reluctance. One of the numbers that you would probably be familiar with is that hypertrophic cardiomyopathy occurs in one in 500 of the population. And that is probably true um, if you take an echo machine out and screen normal, young, healthy individuals, and you'll find that about one in 500 of them will have some thickening of their heart muscle, which is not explained by any other disease. But, but the majority of those people will have no symptoms at all. If you look at people who are actually in the system, if you like, those who've been diagnosed with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and are being seen by, by a cardiologist, the numbers are less. And our best guess is that it's maybe three to four per 10,000 of the population. In this recent piece of work looking at electronic health records in the UK, what you see is the age distribution in women and in men. And you can see that this disease occurs in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy throughout life, but actually the greater frequency is in the middle to later decades. And I think there's still this idea out there that hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is a disease predominantly of the young. And that's clearly not the case. The other thing that this piece of work showed is that if you look at uh, the recording of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in the electronic health records, there's been a 60% increase over the past eight to 10 years. Now, I don't think that's because the disease has become more frequent, but I think it is again because there is this changing attitude that there's a the reluctance to make the diagnosis is reducing, which is obviously a good thing. The second question I think that, that we're examining in the, in the current era is how do we use genetic information in the clinic to improve care and outcome in people with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? Uh, 
And I think the reasons to perform genetic testing are various, and I've listed some of them here on the slide. It helps us confirm the diagnosis of the underlying cause for the condition. It helps us to screen relatives who may have inherited the, the same genetic mutation. And what we would like, I think, to be able to use the genetic information for is assessing someone's prognosis and in helping to guide therapy so as to prevent disease-related complications. If we look at confirmation of diagnosis, well, as I showed this slide, this cartoon earlier, there are many different causes for HCM. So I think by performing genetic testing, this helps us hone our diagnosis down to particular subtypes. An area where I think we now have pretty robust data of the utility of genetic testing is in the screening of relatives. So if we see an, someone who presents for the first time in a family, we can take blood, genetically test them, and if we identify a gene, we can then offer that same testing to the relatives. What we now know is that if a relative carries the same genetic variant, but they have a completely normal ECG and echocardiogram, if you follow those individuals for maybe about 10 years, around half of those individuals will go on to develop the disease. And it's only when they develop the disease that they might become subject to the same complications that others with the condition might have. So I think this gives us robust justification for performing genetic testing in relatives of people with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. In terms of prognosis, uh, until relatively recently, um, this wasn't really translating into robust data in the clinic, but I think we are now starting to see individual mutations that do seem to be associated with a poorer outcome and therefore may help us to target therapy. This is a, a model of do, that, that cartoon I showed you earlier of those filaments sliding across one another, the beta-myosin heavy chain. And there are particular mutations which affect this region of the molecule that it's called the converter region, which does seem to be associated with higher risk of arrhythmia and progressive heart failure. So we're increasingly identifying this and changing the way in which we follow people with these mutations. And again, you see here different what we call survival curves for individual mutations, some of which are more benign than others. And I think this is, if you like, the future, one of the aspects of personalized medicine in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. The other thing, this is just a slide to remind me, is that we're also now understanding the, the biological effect of individual mutation. And this is allowing us to design new drugs to help treat the disease. And I'll return to that uh, in, a, in my second talk of the day on uh, current thinking in cardiomyopathies. Another area which I think has, remains very active is in the way in which we make the diagnosis of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Echocardiography is still, if you like, the workhorse in the clinic. This is usually the first test, along with the electrocardiogram, that suggests someone may have the disease. And it remains an extremely useful tool in identifying the thickening, for looking at the heart function, for identifying outflow obstruction. And indeed, we can now use echocardiography to look more detail at the heart muscle and to see how different parts of the heart muscle are contracting. And we see different patterns when we do that. For example, in here we're looking at the ventricle and seeing that the tip of the ventricle, what we call the apex, is contracting better than other regions. And this is a, an appearance that we often see in people with a condition called amyloidosis. Again, another one of those things that can present as a thick heart. I think one of the revolutionary imaging techniques over the past couple of decades has been cardiac magnetic resonance imaging. And this allows us to take very nice pictures of the heart. It allows us to image parts of the heart that are sometimes difficult to see with echocardiography. But it also allows us to look at the tissue itself using contrast agents, called, one in particular called gadolinium, which shows areas of scarring in the heart muscle. And in this case, again, an appearance which is very typical of that condition, amyloidosis, that I mentioned earlier. We can also use MRI technology to look at other aspects of the muscle itself, in this case, detecting abnormal fatty deposits within the heart muscle in one of the rarer causes of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, a condition called Fabry's disease. 
And more recently, we've also started to apply old technologies, in this case, uh, nuclear scanning. And then we're using bone scans, scans which are look, designed to look for inflammation in bones or tumors within bones. And what we now see is by using these bone scans, you can see the heart lights up again in people with a particular type of amyloidosis. And indeed, there are now other nuclear techniques. This is a technique called positron emission tomography using a different kind of tracer, again, in someone who presents with a thick heart. And here you see the heart light up, but many of the other organs light up because they are infiltrated by a different type of amyloidosis caused by an abnormality in the bone marrow. So we have very powerful imaging tools now, which allow us to characterize the condition and indeed to give us an insight into the underlying cause for the thickening. Now, what about the, the treatment of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? Yeah, this is a, a really active area now in this and other cardiomyopathies. There are new ideas in, in relation to the treatment of obstruction, that phenomenon where the valve moves forwards and obstructs the outflow that I was talking about earlier. There are, for the first time, new drugs being developed or indeed old drugs that are being repurposed, if you will, to treat hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And perhaps most exciting of all, there's the idea that perhaps we can use so-called gene therapies to correct the underlying genetic abnormality that causes the disease in many people. Um, some examples of where we are at present. So we have technical developments. So I, I mentioned earlier the defibrillator, which has transformed our ability to protect people from sudden death. One of the issues with these devices, although they're highly effective, is that you have to have what we call the generator, the defibrillator box itself. And then this is connected to wires that are then passed down into the heart. Now, if these wires fail, um, then they have to be extracted. And that's a procedure which does carry a small risk, particularly if you've had your device for 10, 20 or more years. So there are now approaches being developed where the leads don't have to be put inside the heart, but instead are tunneled underneath the skin, as in this form of a defibrillator called an SICD, something that we're using a lot more now in people with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And indeed, there's even moves to try to develop so-called leadless technologies that's already exists for pacemakers, but potentially for defibrillators in the future. The other thing I think which has, again, really helped us to identify that small group of individuals, and I, I emphasize that it's a small group of individuals with this condition who are at risk of sudden death, is, is the development of so-called risk tools. This is looking at different aspects of the condition um, that you can put into a calculator such as this to give an individual an estimate for what their likely risk is going to be over the next five years. Now, there's nothing magical about this. This calculator is based on experience with thousands of patients. But what we look at is the age of the individual, how thick the heart muscle is, how big the atrium, the top chamber of the heart is, whether or not there's obstruction. And we look at the family history, whether there are rhythm disturbances on a 24-hour tape, and whether that individual has ever had an unexplained blackout. And by putting these various pieces of information into this tool, we can estimate the risk and then use that to guide advice on treatment. Here too, I think there's an evolution. So this is from uh, the 2014 European Society of Cardiology Guidelines. And this was, I think, the sort of standard at the time where we calculate risk and then we define thresholds at which we say a defibrillator should or should not be considered. But I think there's, there's a little bit of a move away from this approach now where we say, okay, well, this is your risk. Let's now talk about what that means to you in terms of the risk of doing something versus the risk of not doing something. And it's a much more sort of personalized and informed conversation that we have with individuals. I think the third area where therapeutics may, again, be transformative in our ability to treat the disease is in the treatment of outflow tract obstruction. <clears throat> now, the conventional approach has been to use drugs which, if you like, reduce the force of contraction of the heart. 
Many of you will be familiar with these drugs, you'll be taking them, drugs such as beta blockers, uh, drugs such as disapyramide, which is a, actually a drug used for controlling the heart rhythm, but which is almost as a side effect and reduces contractility of the heart. And sometimes we use a drug called verapamil. And these drugs can be effective, but in many people they're only partially effective or cause significant side effects. If that's the case, we can resort to what we call septal reduction therapy with surgery or with alcohol ablation. If we come back to the molecular ab abnormalities we see in this disease by understanding this interaction between the different proteins of the heart, companies are now designing drugs that modify this. And in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, in some people at least, this interaction between the proteins can be modified by a drug called Mavacamptan, and there are other drugs now being developed that do the same thing. And we now have randomized trial of this drug in people with obstruction, showing that it can reduce the level of obstruction, dramatically improve symptoms in some individuals, improve their exercise tolerance, and improve markers in the blood that tell us about the stress that the heart is under. And these again dramatically decline with this drug. And this is, I think, a drug that hopefully will be licensed within the next 12 months and will probably, I think, start to displace other drugs such as disapyramide or perhaps even beta blockers in some individuals. An area which I think remains suboptimal with guarding treatment is that of the development of, of heart failure. So the, the heart muscle itself over time can deteriorate in function in some individuals. And actually, if you speak to people with this condition, 50% or more will complain of symptoms of breathlessness and tiredness that relate to abnormal abnormalities in pump function. Indeed, if you look over the course of a lifetime, yeah, maybe 50 to 60% of people will develop symptoms of heart failure. Uh, this development of symptoms and complications of heart failure occurs throughout life. It can occur in the young as well as older people. And for reasons that we don't fully understand, it seems to be more common in women. Even in older women, there's an excess of complications, largely down to heart failure. And I so say the reason for this is because the heart muscle cells start to, if you like, become tired in a way. They, they don't contract as well. But we also start to see increasing fibrosis within the heart muscle, shown here in blue on this histological slide. Now, we don't have drugs that, that knowingly, at least, help prevent this. We've tried many different drugs, the sort of drugs that are used in other cardiomyopathies. So again, beta blockers or ACE inhibitors, ARBs. There have been a number of trials of novel agents, which unfortunately have not um, been successful. But once again, coming back to these new ideas, these new drugs that are being developed and gene-based therapies, these, I think, hold the greatest promise in trying to prevent heart failure. When I talk about gene therapies, there are a variety of things that are being explored. There are sm small strands of what we call RNA that can be inserted into cells and can alter the way in which genes are expressed so they can turn them off or change the way in which they're expressed so they become less damaging to the cell. Or indeed, we might be able to introduce normal copies of the gene to compensate for the loss of function caused by a mutation in a gene. Now, the challenge there is how you get that gene into the heart. Ways that are being explored at the moment are using a particular kind of virus that doesn't cause any damage to the heart muscle cell itself, but acts as, if you like, a, as, a, as, a, as a cargo transporter, which allows us to put genes into heart muscle cells. And this is another area of active research by different companies at the moment. I think one of the intriguing things is that whether it's a, a new molecule or whether it's gene therapy, if we can get something which corrects the underlying genetic defect, this gives us the prospect of being able to prevent the disease in the first place. So I think we can now start to imagine, well, perhaps in five years or 10 years time, if these new um, approaches work, then perhaps we'll be able to treat people at a much earlier stage prevent the disease from developing. And this has already been shown to be possible in an animal model where you can prevent the development of thickening of the heart muscle by giving that drug that I mentioned earlier, Mavacamptan.
So I think, where are we? Well, I'm going to go back to my 1957, or in this case, 65 follow-up to, to that study by um, Weiss Brigden. And here they were saying, new knowledge is steadily accumulating, new criteria are being established, and the histochemist, the cytochemist, the electron microscopist will have their parts to play alongside the clinician, the scientist, and the epidemiologist. In other words, so I think we're now starting to see convergence of multiple different stakeholders in the cardiomyopathy world to try to identify new therapies and also to try to identify what, how these conditions affect people and what the targets for our treatment should be. I'll leave you with a, with a quote, the best way to predict the future is to create it. And I really think for the first time in this disease, we're in a, a phase of creating a whole new out, out, uh, outlook for people with hypertrophic and other forms of cardiomyopathy. So that's my presentation. Um, and what I'd like to do now is hopefully answer some of your questions. I've now got a, a page full of questions. <laughs> so I'm going to forgive me if I don't answer all your questions, but I'm going to start from the top and, and move down in frequency of, of likes here. So the first question is, can comparing an echo of the heart taken in 2019 and 2021 prove the rate of what could potentially be the heart's condition in 10 years time in that particular individual CM? Yeah, that's, that's a nice question. So those of you who come to our clinic, I'm sure the, the clinics of, of other specialist centers around the country will know that we sometimes almost ritualistic perform an echocardiogram. And the reason we do that is to do to answer that particular question, you know, is there evidence that the heart is changing? Now, the sort of things we're going to be looking at are the thickness of the muscle, because over time, the thickness can reduce. The function of the heart, you'll look, many of you will be familiar with this number, the ejection fraction, how the heart contracts, is something, again, if you track this over a long period, this can also decline in individuals. And it's important that we're alert to that happening. Also really important that when we take an echo is we look at changes in the, the size of the top chamber of the heart, the atrium, um, because as that starts to enlarge, then people become prone to a particular heart rhythm called atrial fibrillation, where the, the top chamber of the heart no longer contracts well. Um, and there, that means if we can spot that before the atrial fibrillation happens, we can start people on blood thinners and prevent the main complication of atrial fibrillation, which is, which is a stroke. Um, so I think, yep, serial echocardiography is, is, is very valuable in looking at long-term changes in the heart. Second question, really great one. What, what is the prognosis for someone for, with non-obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? So the, the majority of people who have symptoms with this condition have obstruction. Um, but there are a proportion of individuals, maybe 20%, 25%, maybe more, who have symptoms of chest tightness, breathlessness, fatigue, um, who um, have no obstruction. And there, the prognosis depends on the severity of thickening, the presence of arrhythmia, also the severity of their symptoms and the function of the heart. At the moment, our main treatments for that are to give diuretics, we sometimes use beta blockers, calcium antagonists, but I think we have to admit the treatment is suboptimal. But there are now trials about to start using some of these new drugs that I've mentioned today, um, which are designed to try and help the heart to relax more effectively, hopefully reduce the symptoms, and hopefully in time to improve prognosis. So again, I think there is hope on the horizon for people with non-obstructive disease. Yeah, that's a great question. I wish I knew the answer to this one. Why, do, why does hypertrophic cardiomyopathy develop later in life and does it progress once you have it? So it, I think it, it is true that the majority of people will develop their symptoms in, in adulthood. Um, when, when we speak to people with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, they often start to experience symptoms in their early 20s and 30s. But we can see new onset disease all the way up to the 70s and 80s. And, and that process isn't well understood. It may be that if you have, for example, a genetic mutation that causes hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, that the cells of the heart can compensate for that. But as you start to age, the compensation mechanism starts to, again, become less efficient. And then the effect of the mutation breaks through 
Um, another idea is that you're, you have this mutation, but it takes an additional trigger to interact with that mutation. Um, so for example, common conditions like high blood pressure or obesity may also interact with an underlying genetic defect. Uh, the truth is we don't fully understand why it is that you get late onset. It seems to be more common with particular genes than others. Does the condition change once you have it, once you've been diagnosed? Um, so it's very rare at the time that people present for the condition, for the thickening to get worse, for example. It does occasionally happen, but that's really quite rare, except possibly in children. But what we tend to do, well, what we tend to see is what I was describing earlier. Over many years, we start to see actually thinning changes in the, the ejection fraction, the function of the heart, changes in the left atrium. But progression with increasing thickness is really quite uncommon. Um, third question here I have, is Mavacampton available yet for the treatment of obstruction in Hocum? It, it isn't at the moment. Um, the company are applying for licenses in North America and hopefully soon uh, in Europe and in the UK. It will then have to go through the regulatory process. Um, that usually takes about a, a year. And of course, whether it gets licensed will be dependent on the adjudication by NICE. And there are various things that feed into that consideration, one of which, of course, unfortunately, will be the price of the drug. So um, I, fingers crossed that we'll have that drug available, but it, it's going to take a little while yet before we do have it available in the clinic. Um, these are great questions today. What causes heart scarring and how does it affect hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? So scarring is present in maybe about 60% of hearts in people with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. We, we detect it using MRI scanning. Um, often it's very, very mild. It's sort of very localized, um, but in some people it can be more extensive. Um, why does it happen? Um, I think in the past, it was thought that some of the scarring occurred because of abnormalities in the blood flow to the heart muscle. Um, we, we know that that happens in some people. It may be the cause for some of their symptoms. And it has been felt that if you get severe impairment of the blood flow, that, that can damage the heart muscle and cause scarring of that. That may be one factor. I think actually it's probably not the major factor. I think the reason that it happens is that there's this crosstalk between the different types of cell within the heart muscle. As well as muscle cells, you have other cells which are called fibroblasts, which can secrete a lot of um, what we call collagen and cause scarring. And I think if your heart muscle cells are under stress, they can influence these other cells and cause them to lay down excessive amounts of scar tissue or fibrosis. Uh, but it is certainly part of the condition that we, we try to monitor on a regular basis. Um, I have a question here now. So I've, I've been diagnosed with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in 2019. I've gone through a genetic test, but they can't identify any genes. Um, I'm wondering, could physical injury to the heart, I was hit by a cricket ball when I was 18, cause HCM. So the short answer to the second part of that is absolutely not. There's, there's no evidence that, that trauma can result in, in something like this. Um, but your experience of, not, of not, a gene not being identified is relatively common. So if, with modern genetic testing, we identify something um, maybe in about 40% of cases, 40 to 50% of cases. That doesn't mean, mean that in those with a negative genetic test that it isn't an inheritable disease. Um, it may just be that you have an ident a, a genetic abnormality which has not yet been identified. And we, we continue to describe new genes that cause hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, it could be that there's, you have what we call a, a common variant. So this is an important aspect of the genetic, of, genetics of this and other diseases we're starting to understand that in the population, you know, we all carry variants in our genes, most of which never cause a disease. But in some people, if you, if you have a lot of different variants, then that may tip you over to developing a condition, particularly if it interacts with some other environmental factors such as high blood pressure or obesity, sleep apnea, and that sort of thing. So it may be that some people have what we call a polygenic effect rather than a single genetic spelling mistake you can identify on a gene test. Um, how does hypertrophic cardiomyopathy lead to atrial fibrillation? And what can be done to 
alleviate AF symptoms. Yeah, but this is really critical in the assessment of, of HCM. So the main driver to atrial fibrillation in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is that the atrium over time, because it's having to contract to force blood into that thickened, sometimes stiffened ventricle, the atrium can increase in size. And as it increases in size, it becomes more prone to developing a sort of an irregular chaotic rhythm, atrial fibrillation. Um, the kind of symptoms that it will cause, it makes the heart become irregular and rapid sometimes, and that can exacerbate or cause symptoms of breathlessness, sometimes chest tightness, fatigue, the way in which we treat it is to try, if we can, to put the heart back into a normal rhythm. Um, and that can be done by something called cardioversion, where you have a brief general anesthetic, 30 second anesthetic, and we literally shock the heart back in. It's a very safe technique. Many of you have probably had that done. Sometimes you, you, you have to give additional drugs to maintain normal rhythm, and that may be drug beta blockers. Um, it may be drugs such as amiodarone. And in a few selected individuals, we may have to do what's called AF ablation, where we pass catheters inside the heart and sort of freeze areas within the heart that act as triggers for atrial fibrillation. Uh, some people go into atrial fibrillation and remain there, and, and that's okay, as long as we can control the rhythm in terms of its rate, so we can slow the heart rate down, but also critically, we have to put people on blood thinners, on warfarin, or now increasingly new oral anticoagulants, because the second major complication of atrial fibrillation is that you get small clots forming inside the atrium, which can then fly out of the heart and cause a stroke. So anticoagulation, rhythm control by trying to get the heart back into a normal rhythm, or rate control, slowing the heart if you're in permanent atrial fibrillation. Um, so are there processes in place for reassessing people? Yeah, again, really great question. So if, if we've performed a genetic test and it's negative, can we bring people back and test them for a new gene? And this is a really important question. And if I'm honest, I think we, we don't do this well at the moment. Um, it's a sort of process that we call recall where you know we should be calling people back or contacting them and saying look we've got these new genes uh, we would now like to extend genetic testing the reason it's not done well at the moment is partly logistics um, you know how do you keep people on a on a on record how do you have a, a way of identifying them and bringing them back and having the facilities and the resources to do that Another problem in the past has been the way in which we do the genetic testing. So at the moment, genetic testing is often done with what we call a panel. So you have maybe 10 or 20 different genes which account for the majority of genetic mutations. You screen those genes. If you don't find anything, well, then if you want to come back and do a further genetic test for a new gene, you've got to take another blood sample and test that new gene. That will, I think, become less of a problem, at least within the UK, as we start to move towards what's called whole genome sequencing. So when you have a genetic test, the entire genome, all 24, 25,000 genes, will be interrogated, although the results will be, if you like, virtual. They'll be on a virtual panel of 20 genes. But should a new gene become available, you could then go back to that genetic data set and see if that individual carries a genetic variant. And I think that's going to be the, one of the key steps in transforming our ability to, if you like, virtually recall people to test their genes for those variants. Um, what effect, again, really, really good question. Um, what, what effect does weight loss have in obese people with hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy? So I think this is, uh, an area which we do, again, not very well, maybe don't pay sufficient attention to. You know, if you have obstruction, you'll have your, your, your symptoms. If you're significantly overweight, that will, be, that will of course contribute to, to the symptoms that you have. Yeah, you know, that the heart is already compromised because it has cardiomyopathy and, it, and obstruction. 
if you add to that the additional work that the heart has to do because someone is is overweight you can imagine how reducing weight may, may help symptoms um, i think within cardiovascular clinics the standard sort of cardiovascular clinics that is not done well we, we don't have systems in place to help people lose weight because we we know that losing weight is a really tough thing to do um, so i think for for future management of obstruction i think that's something i would like to be built into if you like the standard of care for the treatment of obstruction um yep yeah. so should all patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy receive a beta blocker or calcium channel blocker if tolerated regardless of symptoms um, is there a protective aspect of taking these drugs or is it just used to manage symptoms so my own view is that you would should only use those drugs if someone has symptoms that may respond to the drug there there has been a historical use of particularly beta blockers in people with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy on the belief that it it's a good thing to give a beta blocker to you know, prevent complications in the future but we really have no evidence that those drugs have prognostic benefit and indeed what you can do is if you put someone on a beta blocker or a calcium channel blocker you may give them symptoms because of a side effect of the drug. So my own practice would only be to use those drugs if someone has symptoms. The one exception to that might be in someone who has really high gradient, really severe obstruction. And they, they tell me that they don't have symptoms despite me interrogating them closely. I might use a, a beta blocker in that context, but normally I, I try to avoid drugs unless I really have to use them. Um, if the incidence of heart failure is more in older women, is that due to reduced hormones or is there a case of prolonged HRT? We, we just don't understand the reason for that. It, it may be a hormonal effect, but the, the excess complications that we see, particularly in terms of mortality, also occurs in the younger age group. In fact, the, the biggest difference between men and women is in people in their 20s, 30s and 40s. So, so I think whilst you know, intuitively it would seem to be an effect related to to, to menopause and loss of sex hormones in older women. I don't think that can be the, the, the only explanation. And I think it's probably something much more fundamental in the way in which gene expression is regulated by, by sex hormones within the cell. Um, yep, very good question. What is the relationship between hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, sleep apnea and hypertension? I have all three. I have an okay BMI and previously fit healthy lifestyle. So, so the answer to that question is that if you have sleep apnea and if you have hypertension and if you're overweight each of those things can thicken the heart muscle question often we face in the clinic is are they sufficient explanation for the thickening that we see and that can be difficult and i think probably in some people it, it probably is so it's not actually a genetic underlying genetic condition the individual has it's it's a consequence of those other common conditions I think we also increasingly think that there's an interaction between those things and possibly the underlying genetics. So if you have the gene, it may be in that individual, it's not enough to cause disease unless you develop those things. So much in, as I was saying in response to the question about being overweight and does it contribute to symptoms, I think these sort of lifestyle modifications and management of other common conditions such as hypertension are a critical part of the management of, of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, now, uh, next question is when using the, the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy sudden death risk calculator, should episodes of presyncope be including when answering yes or no for unexplained syncope? That sounds like a question from a cardiologist. Uh, so the answer is you're going to have to make that decision yourself. So, so the like all these things, these tools are a guide. So it's a little bit like family history, for example. When would you put family history into the model? If, if there's a distant relative who dies suddenly in their late 40s, is that the same as three young siblings who've died in their 20s or 30s? And intuitively, again, the answer to that question is no, but you do have to make a judgment call. What, what presyncope means here is, is you know, the feeling that you're going to blackout or you have a near blackout but don't quite go. And I think it really depends on, on the nature of that symptom, when it occurred, what the circumstances were, were there other explanations. 
sometimes when you use the tool, if you, if you put in syncope or indeed any variable, you can see what effect it's going to have on the risk. And sometimes when you put these variables in, actually it doesn't materially change the risk estimate. So I'm down to my last, last minute now, so I, I'm, I'm probably not going to dig into any of these other questions now, but I think that, you know, thank you for asking them. They, they've been great. And there's a long, long list of equally great conditions, which we'll try to answer perhaps at the Q and A later in the day. Um, what I hope I've been able to show you is that, you know, we've, we've come a long way since the first descriptions of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. We understand a lot more now about what causes the condition. We have treatments already that are very effective in preventing uh, some of the disease related complications and in treating symptoms. But as I say, I think the really exciting thing is, is the incredible activity there is now in developing new therapeutic approaches, new drugs and gene therapies to provide us with perhaps a cure for the condition in the not too distant future. So thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to seeing you again during the day. Thank you very much.